Okay, welcome to lecture five. And today we are going to talk about fermions. But uh, first, let's see if there are questions. Yeah, what was your question? So we take infinitesimal transformation. So can it be shown that uh, to all orders of uh, uh, it is a symmetry of... Good question. So I'll just repeat the question. Uh, the question is, uh, when we consider infinitesimal symmetries, does it necessarily mean that we have symmetry under finite transformations uh, with that parameter? So. Um, the answer is that in general, if we have an infinitesimal symmetry, it can be extended to a finite range, but we don't know a priori whether that finite range extends to an infinite range. So for example, if I do an infinitesimal phase transformation, then you know that the transformation is, so supposing I have phi is the field and it goes to e to the i theta phi. Phi is complex, theta is a constant. So this is equivalent to delta phi equals i theta phi uh, for infinitesimal theta. Now nothing in this equation tells you that theta is valued between 0 and 2 pi. But this equation tells you that because if it crosses 2 pi, this phase comes back to itself. Okay? So theta is really an angle, but this doesn't tell you immediately. So you have to think a little bit. Uh, when you try to extend it to the finite version, you'll find it's an angle. But some theories might have a symmetry which doesn't have an i. In that case, usually this theta takes values from 0 to infinity or minus to plus infinity. So those things one has to work out. But the general rule is that if I'm given a Lie algebra, then I can exponentiate the algebra to get the group. That's the mathematical statement. So this is in the group because this is a group element of u1. Okay, and i theta, so basically uh, the algebra of u1 is trivial, uh, it just has the identity as its generator. So, so yeah, so this, this is a transformation by a parameter theta times i times the generator of the algebra times phi. So, yeah, so the relation that you're asking about is a relation between a Lie algebra and a Lie group. So it's quite, also it's not unique. For example, there can be one Lie algebra which might correspond to more than one Lie group. For example, SU2 and SO3 have the same Lie algebra, J plus, J minus, and J3 satisfying the relations you already know. Uh, but they are two different groups. They differ by a double covering, but uh, they are therefore they are different groups. Yeah, yeah, good. Yes, yes. Yeah, but then you have to calculate, see, if this is a symmetry, then it's a symmetry to all, all orders. You just have to be consistent which order you stop at. But the beautiful thing is that by studying first order, we get the algebra. Second order doesn't give you any new algebra or new structure. <coughs> by consistency, it follows and therefore once you study it to lowest order, which is the infinitesimal one, that's enough information to exponentiate it to get a group up to possible ambiguities if there is more than one group for the same algebra. Yeah, that was a good question and it does arise in many contexts. Okay, so that's... Uh, <coughs> So last time we basically finished talking about scalars. I know I rushed through the Euclidean time or imaginary time business, but first it's in the notes. Secondly, we'll be revisiting it when we do path integrals. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Today we are going to do fermions. <coughs> now, essentially the first thing that we know about relativistic fermions is that they satisfy the Dirac equation. At the free level. And you should always keep in mind that there are hidden indices in this. So if we just put the indices, this is alpha, beta. Here there is a delta, alpha, beta. Here there is psi, beta. And this is the thing, which is 0. So gamma acts like a matrix on this set of components. 
it it's like a vector it has four components but because there is already a thing called a vector in the lorentz group this one is called the spinner okay the point is it's like looks like a vector but its transformations under the group are not the same as those of an ordinary vector so when you rotate uh, for example your coordinate system then you know how a vector transforms it just transforms by a rotation matrix spinner requires something slightly different uh, if i have time i'll try to give you a little exercise about spinners in 1 plus 1 space time dimensions it's very amusing there you will see how simple it really is hmm? uh, all the complication that dirac had to deal with and we have had to deal with ever since with gamma matrices and all that is because we are in four dimensions if we were in three it would be much easier if we were in two it would be completely trivial so that's life if you are in 10 then it's even more difficult so it's all up to you which one you work in now the lagrangian for this is i psi bar gamma psi minus m psi bar psi and here the indices are contracted and bar means the psi dagger times gamma 0 and generically these sizes are complex okay now let's uh, unpack this lagrangian a little bit uh, therefore in view of that last relation uh, i can separate out this mu being uh, time and space so the time component simply gives me i psi dagger psi dot because here you get psi 0 but from psi bar also you get psi 0 and gamma 0 squared is 1 so you just get this in 1 plus 1 dimension how much gamma matrices do you take none there are no gamma matrices that's why i said it's trivial give me time i think i'll put the i'll put it in the notes or i'll put it on the blog right now i don't want to go into it it's very cute but it's uh, not going to help because we have to do this but i will uh, if you, if i don't do it just mail me and i'll, I'll definitely do it no gamma matrices you you might think that there are some gamma matrices and you can use them but you don't need to it's that simple good uh this plus i psi dagger gamma 0 gamma i del i psi so that's the full expression for this when mu is i and then there is minus m psi dagger gamma 0 psi so that's the whole uh lagrangian and the lagrangian <coughs> density and um, as always we sometimes call this whole thing the kinetic term because it's the lorentz invariant kinetic term but really speaking if we really by kinetic we mean time time evolving then this is the kinetic term because it has the time derivative okay and a amusing feature which you may not have spent time thinking about is that it's first order in d by dt unlike scalars whose lagrangian is second order in d by dt because phi dot squared this has very immediate consequence the immediate consequence is when we calculate the hamiltonian something little bit shocking happens so so this is all visible to you yeah good okay uh so if i try to calculate the hamiltonian density i should write the canonical momentum for pi which i'll call pi psi and i'll compute it here so pi psi is equal to i have to differentiate this whole lagrangian in psi dot so that leaves i psi dagger <coughs> now i have to write pi psi psi dot minus l hmm, that's the hamiltonian and then i have to uh, okay then we'll see what i have to do but the amusing thing now you know that for bosons when i for scalars when i do this you get pi phi dot minus l and this term is double of the kinetic term so it cancels half of it and then half of it we write as half pi squared that's not what happens here because l contains this term which is exactly i pi psi dot because this is pi so they just cancel and so i'm left with minus i psi dagger gamma 0 gamma i del i psi uh, plus m psi bar psi 
that's the whole Hamiltonian and it's commonly written uh, and maybe this is what Dirac also did as I psi dagger alpha I del I psi where alpha is just alpha I are just minus I okay so the time derivative term has actually just dropped out that's a weird thing about fermions and um, I think the simplest, the weirdest example I can give you is imagine I wasn't doing field theory but imagine my fields were space independent. Just I could take configurations which are space independent then this term would be zero in the Hamiltonian because it has a space derivative. Imagine more, moreover that the fermion is massless then this term is zero and then the Hamiltonian is zero. That's, that is strange. Okay. It's not that strange uh, as we'll see eventually. Basically what will happen is in that case the system will have two degenerate states of spin up and spin down. They'll have the same energy which I can call zero. So fermions work in a very, very weird and different way from bosons. Good. Okay. Now uh, I suppose you learnt also something called the two component notation. Did you learn that in your QFT1? The size are four component. There's also a way of writing them in terms of two component spinners. Yes, no. Yes, I L I R. So I don't know exactly how it was presented there. So I'll just review it so that you have a, you fix the idea. One reason to review it is that, you know, when you are learning it first, it seems like a lot of formulae and one loses what is the physics. Here I'll try to highlight what is the physical point. So the first thing is, we define a matrix gamma 5 which is just the product of all the gamma matrices and we'll notice that gamma 5 squared is 1. And now we'll define psi left or right as half 1 minus or plus gamma 5 of psi. So given a Dirac spinner psi, I can project it. It's easy to check that because of that condition this whole matrix squares to itself. So it's a projection operator. So this projection operator with the minus sign gives me something called psi L and with the plus sign it gives me something called psi R. And obviously psi L plus psi R is equal to psi. That's obvious from this equation. If I project onto two orthogonal subspaces and add back, I get back what I started with. Good. Now, this uh, L and R is called handedness or chirality. Chirality is just the Greek word for handedness. And there's some sense in which these are left handed and right handed, which uh, actually is best described in a particle physics course because it really impacts the results of experiments. If I send in a left or right handed fermion into a collision, uh, it will do something, they will do something different. I mean, depending on what the other one is. Obviously, it's a pure convention and I could have written R slash L. But if I send in two left handed fermions or one left handed one and one right handed, the answer will be different. So that's independent of convention. Hmm? Like types and unlike types. Okay. Now this one we can make a little more transparent by going to a special basis of gamma matrices called the Weyl basis. Notice that until now, we didn't have to bring up any basis for gamma matrices. And there are many ways of finding gamma matrices which satisfy that relation that gamma mu, gamma nu, anti-commutators, twice eta mu nu. Uh, but one of them is the Weyl basis and the special feature of it is that in that basis, the gamma 5 is like this. Some authors might have it the other way, these might be 1 and those might be minus 1. We can never get rid of these signs when you discuss these problems. But it's basically like that. And now, <coughs> half 1 minus gamma 5 is simply 1, 1. So, identity here and then 0 everywhere. Hmm? And half 1 plus gamma 5 has the same thing in the lower side. 0, 0, 0. These are all 2 by 2. And then here, 
1 0 0 1 that simply means that in the while basis if I project a Dirac fermion onto the left and right handed fermions I'm basically either keeping the top two components or keeping the bottom two components and setting the other ones to zero yes so, uh, choosing a basis is the same as choosing a representation yeah representation right? of the gamma so, matrices uh, if gamma matrices follow some algebra like yes some anti commutator yes. Yes. then those determine the properties of the gamma matrix. that's correct now choosing a representation can i like confer more properties to or does it so define? representation of a clifford algebra which is the name for the gamma matrix algebra is not unique so you can have many represent you can have many realizations of the matrices okay meaning as numerical matrices the theorem is that whatever you do in physics, you will get the same answer no matter which one you use. So there is no difference between using one or using the other. It is the analog of using a coordinate system. Okay? So all representations are equally good as long as they satisfy the same algebra. But in some of them, some property is more transparent and in some other ones, another property may be more transparent. And actually I am glad you brought it up because quantum field theory is full of instances where we can do things many ways, where the final answer is the same, the physical answer, but the route that we travel is quite different. It's a bit like having two points on, I don't know, on earth where there are different shipping routes, but and they, one you might get storms in winter, one you might get rocks, one you might get something else. So you have to wisely decide which route you are going to take. But actually, if you take any of the routes successfully, you'll reach the same point. But it could be difficult to take that route successfully. It might be more challenging in one or other uh, representation. And so we should always, this is something that we, I think irritates people outside field theory somehow, that in field theory we often uh, you know, uh, say, well, to discuss this issue, I'm going to take this uh, uh, approach. And to discuss that other issue in the same maybe lecture or in the same half, now I'm going to use that other one. It's, a, it's how we fix gauge, which we'll do starting from the next lecture. You can fix the gauge of a gauge theory in many ways. And uh, very famously, there was a result that to prove renormalizability of non-abelian gauge theories, for which Etoft and Welkman got a Nobel Prize. They used the one gauge to prove the renormalizability, but a different gauge to prove the unitarity, which you want to prove because the physical theory should be unitary. And in the unitary gauge, it's hard to see why it should be renormalizable. And the renormalizable gauge, it's hard to see why it should be unitary. But since any gauge is equally good, since you got both the results in some gauge, therefore both the results are true. It's quite an exciting feature once you get used to it. Okay, so with these projections, psi L in this, in this basis, in while representation of gamma matrices, while basis really means that so in this psi l has two non zero components and two zero components so i'll call it chi l and zero so this is two component and this is just two zeros that you can see just from this fact if i take this matrix and multiply a four component spinner the lower two components will be set to zero and the upper two components will remain whatever they were. So actually chi L1 and 2 are the same as psi L1 and 2. They are just the same numbers, but I give it a different name because I want to refer to the pair of them uh, at once. Similarly, psi right is equal to 0 and chi r. Okay? So the advantage of this is that now instead of talking about one Dirac spinner psi, I can talk about two while spinners, chi L and chi R, each of which is two components. I just found a way to keep two components and another two components. Now you could say, why did I take all the trouble to go into some while basis and not just keep two components and two <coughs> components? Well, when I make a Lorentz transformation, Something which has some component zero need not after the transformation still have that component being zero. Just like a vector may have, may point along the z axis after I make a rotation, it's not of the form zero, zero something, right? It now it's all its components may be non zero. So there's no invariant way to pick out some components. But if you use a representation of the 
I mean the wild representation of gamma matrices. Oh, actually, even if you don't, if you use gamma 5, then this is an invariant way. So this is invariant under the continuous Lorentz transformations. And this property, if you make it true once, will continue to be, continue to be true after a Lorentz transformation. That's why we do it. And then in the while basis, we can also see with our eyes what it is. In any other basis, the psi L will have four components with two relations among them. Those relations may not be easy to see. Okay, but here it has four components where two are just zero. That's easy. And now after a Lorentz transformation, they'll still be zero. So chi L and chi R in that sense are decoupled and that's very convenient. And now we can actually introduce certain matrices which are like smaller versions of gamma matrices, but just warning, they are not gamma matrices. Sigma mu is the matrix one and the three Pauli matrices. <coughs> and sigma bar mu is the matrix one and minus the three Pauli matrices. These are all two by two matrices. So sigma mu is a vector, four component vector. Each component is a two by two matrix. One of them is identity and three are Pauli matrices. Note that Pauli matrices are traceless. So are gamma matrices, but one is not traceless. So you can't think of these four as all being gamma matrices. They don't together obey the gamma matrix algebra. That's also obvious because one cannot anti-commute with anything. One commutes with everything. <coughs> okay. So they are just matrices, but they arise by reducing the gamma matrices according to this projection in the while basis. And with this, you get the following equations of motion. So the Dirac, so Lagrangian first. So the Lagrangian now becomes, it's nothing but the same Lagrangian we started with, just in the while basis and after going to these two while components, left and right. And you find it's a very straightforward exercise that you get I chi L dagger, sigma bar mu del mu chi L plus I chi R dagger, sigma mu del mu, chi r minus m chi r dagger chi l plus chi l dagger chi r. And something, some things are visible here which were not visible previously. Uh, one of them is, okay, one thing that simplified here is that there's no bar operation on the Fermion. So we had psi bar, which was psi dagger gamma zero. Gamma zero is dead. Uh, this dagger just means uh, transpose. I mean, sorry, just means complex conjugate. And of course, to multiply the complex conjugate with that one, I would transpose it if I want. I mean, you can just call it transpose, <coughs> but it's really complex conjugate. Just each component is complex conjugated. Yeah. Uh, you have the indices on uh, sigma mu. So presumably it's like uh, you're contracting it with them, yes, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, so, yes. How do we know that uh, it has the correct transformation property? Good. So, uh, uh, the answer to that, and actually that uh, is something that you may need in some contexts in particle physics. So, let me do it, though I had not put it in my notes, but maybe I will now. So, in components, Psi, remember the Dirac spinner had one index alpha which took four values, one, two, three, four. Okay. How about chi and chi left and chi right? So we write chi left as chi left alpha, where alpha is one and two. This is not to be confused with the alpha index of the Dirac spinner. If it is confusing you actually, let's call it A and just say that A is one and two. So far so good. However, chi right has an index that's called a dot and a dot also takes values 1 and 2 but a dot is not a okay so these are because right because these two are the indices of a left handed spinner while spinner and these are the indices of a right handed while spinner and we cannot simply uh, multiply them and contract these indices because we won't get Lorentz invariants. So this is all basically rules of Lorentz group. 
uh, in group theory course in principle it would have been nice if this were done but I don't think it's done here in the group theory course but Lorentz group is very important at least for particle physics okay it is done okay so then dotted and undotted spinners oh okay that may be the most useful thing that you need of the Lorentz group okay now the sigma matrix has the indices uh, okay, first rule, chi L dagger, okay, this is going to be a bit, uh, bit complicated because I haven't written it down anywhere. Sir, yes. Uh, these, uh, just to confirm, A and A dot, these are uh, the components of the two component, uh, xi L and uh, xi, right? Exactly. Uh, xi L or chi. Chi L and Chi R, exactly. So they are, that's why I've written, right? A equals 1 and 2 and A dot is 1 and 2. Hmm? Now, uh, the point is that roughly Chi L dagger has a A dot and Chi R dagger has an A. Okay? So this A and A dot get exchanged by taking the dagger. And the sigma matrix, sigma mu, has the indices alpha, um, so sigma mu has the indices alpha A, sorry, A, B dot and sigma bar mu has the indices A dot B. Okay. Now you can see that this has the index, index A dot, this has A dot B, this has B. So that's an invariant. This has A, A B dot, B dot. That's also an invariant. Okay. Now, there is some story about raising and lowering these A's and B's which I am not prepared to go into here. And so, this formula might not be absolutely 100% uh, correct up to raising and lowering, but conceptually this is the idea. Okay. So, we have to be clear about what we can contract with what. Also, by the way, here you can see that chi L has an undotted index, chi R has a dotted, but, but there is a dagger which undots it. So I can contract these two, okay? For this reason, I cannot multiply chi L with chi L. There's no way to contract two indices of the same thing, of the same type. So this is a bit of a complicated story, but you know, it would take two or three lectures to do proper justice to it. But if you are planning to work in particle physics, I think you should spend that time. It's in all the particle physics textbooks. Hmm? It is just a little bit of uh, algebra and it works. Good. Okay. So this is the story of wild spinner. So we see that a wild spinner in the four component notation is a Dirac spinner with two of its components zero or the other two components zero. Okay. Now there's another condition called the Majorana condition, which says a Majorana spinner is one which satisfies that psi, now in the four component notation, psi alpha is C psi star. So C alpha beta psi star beta, where C alpha beta is called the charge conjugation matrix. So it's a four by four matrix. The problem about C is that it has to be calculated separately in every uh, basis of gamma matrices. So it will be different in the while basis, in the Dirac basis and so on. So we just call it C. There are some rules to calculate it in any given basis. But once you know it, the statement is that psi is equal to C alpha beta and psi beta star. Now, if C was not in the picture, it would be saying that psi is equal to psi star. So what does that say? It says that psi is real. Okay. Now, why not just say from the beginning that psi is equal to psi star, namely take it real. Unfortunately, if we work in an arbitrary basis, then a real spinner after a Lorentz transformation will become complex. So that condition won't be preserved by Lorentz transformations. But if we impose it this way, then it is preserved by Lorentz transformations. Okay, that's why we have to introduce a matrix C. However, if we could find a basis of gamma matrices in which C is 1, then in that basis, Psi would be just real. And there is such a basis called the Majorana basis. It's different from the Weyl basis, 
the Y basis was convenient to understand the wild spinners, the Majorana basis is convenient to understand Majorana spinners. Later we will try to see what each of these looks like in the other basis, but first this. So the key, of course you can find the matrices in appendix of any QFT book in the Majorana basis, but the key property is that C is 1. And therefore in this basis and only in this basis, a Majorana spinner is real. And as I said, because we have done this by carefully defining some matrix uh, in terms of the basis, uh, this, property, this reality property will survive if we make a Lorentz transformation. Otherwise, it's meaningless. You can make something real in one system, but it's no use if your Lorentz transformation is spoiling it because we are doing relativistic quantum field theory. What we do should have a meaning in all Lorentz frames. Okay. So the Majorana spinner then is real. Now you could ask what does the Majorana spinner look like in the wild representation and this is quite an illuminating thing. Uh, remember don't confuse Majorana representation with Majorana spinner. Majorana representation is one possible representation of gamma matrices. Majorana spinner is a constrained spinner which has uh, either only real components or these are related to the complex conjugate by some linear transformation. It's the same number of conditions regardless whether C is 1 or not. Hmm? It cuts down the number of components from 4 complex to 4 real, whichever way you do it. But it does it in different ways depending what is C. And it, the easiest way is when C is 1, then every component is real. Okay. So good, what does a Majorana spinner look like? Well, the answer is quite amusing. It looks like a first two components being just some two component spinner and the other two being I sigma 2 chi L dagger. This is not sigma squared, this is the Pauli matrix sigma 2, the imaginary one, 0 minus i, i, 0. So i sigma 2 actually is 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And this is of course nothing but the tenor, the epsilon symbol epsilon a, b. Hmm? The two dimensional version of the Levi Civita epsilon symbol. You know the three dimensional version, but here are indices a and b on these two component things only take two values. So there is a two component version of Levi-Civita <coughs> epsilon and it's this matrix. In three dimensions it's no longer a matrix, it's a three third rank tensor but in two dimensions it's a second rank tensor which is just a matrix. So you can also say that this is I, uh, this is just epsilon A B, chi, so A dot B dot chi L. I told you dagger has a B dot. So this is how the uh, the Majorana spinner breaks into wild spinners. What is the physics we want to take away from this? If I know chi L, then I have enough data to make a Majorana spinner. Whatever chi L you give me, I will put the lower component to be that dagger of that times this epsilon and I will get a Majorana spinner. One second. On the other hand, if you give me a chi L and I make a four component spinner which has zero over here, I will get a wild spinner. So the wild spinner and the Majorana spinner have the same amount of information, but it's packaged differently. Yes, the question? Is there an equivalent representation in terms of chi r? Or? Yeah, you could just call this chi r and then that will be epsilon ab in terms of chi r dagger. The statement here is that chi r is chi dagger of L up to this epsilon symbol. So of course you can invert it, you can take dagger of that whole equation and say chi l is chi dagger of r. So. One of them we take to be independent and the other one we take to be just a linear, linearly dependent but on its complex conjugate. You see the good thing about the complex conjugate, this sort of gives you the idea that this contains not just the components but also their conjugates because in its mind this spinner is real. That's what Majorana condition means that it's sort of real. It just doesn't look real. Okay, But 
in the so in the wild basis it's not going to look real because that was the bad basis for Majorana spinners but it still looks like something which contains Kyle and Kyle dagger and nothing no more independent information than that so you can say it's half as much information as a Dirac spinner okay similarly if I have a if I have two Majorana spinners in the Majorana basis say Sai and uh, Sai tilde both Majorana, then in the Majorana basis I can make a, sorry, Psi tilde and Psi hat, then I can make a Dirac spinner by taking Psi tilde plus I Psi hat. So what happens under complex conjugation? This stays the same, this stays the same, I changes sign. So this is a complex spinner and the general complex for component spinner is the Dirac spinner. So you can assemble a Dirac spinner out of two Majorana spinners. Already I showed you, but this is works in the, okay, this actually works in general. You can just take the sum of two Majorana spinners with an I in between and you'll always get a Dirac spinner. And there, uh, what you do is you take the sum of two wild spinners of opposite handedness and then again you get a Dirac spinner. So now you understand that Dirac spinner is the one with more information and Majorana or Weil are the ones with half that information. And what is that half information? Well, you know that Dirac famously, one second, famously predicted that there would be an antiparticle. So he was trying to describe the electron, but he ended up also describing the positron. I, I hope you know all this. Not everyone is convinced. Dirac, just trying to find a relativistic wave equation, realized that because his field has four components, uh, it cannot describe just the electron because electron just has spin up and down. What are these other two components? Then by doing this mode expansion and so on, he realized that formally they behave like negative energy solutions, but he said, no, actually they are antiparticles. Okay. A Majorana spinner is a, is, describes a particle which is its own antiparticle. What is the statement with Klein-Gordon equation? If I have a real Klein-Gordon field phi, then it describes a particle which is its own antiparticle. But if I have a complex Klein-Gordon field, uh, uh, Klein field phi, then it describes a particle and an antiparticle. Okay. The Higgs boson is described by what? Real or complex phi? Real. So it's its own antiparticle as far as we know. It's provisional because there may be more Higgs bosons, maybe we miss something, but as per today's experiments, it's real and therefore it is its own antiparticle, okay? No uh, Majorana uh, fermions are known in nature, but the fact that they are possible is very, very important. And in fact, they are of interest also in condensed matter physics, where however, people usually work in two dimensions where all this gamma matrix stuff is irrelevant as I've already told you. Okay. On the other hand, what is a wild spinner? It's just the left-handed part of a Dirac spinner and or the right-handed part. So again, there are two. So, yes. Yes. You know, uh, there, uh, the C alpha beta, we, uh, we assumed it to be identity and then we didn't. We didn't assume it to I be mean, identity. I, we it, 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 it has to satisfy some conditions which I haven't explained which uh, transform the Dirac equation into the charge conjugate equation, which means if I have a charged particle in solving the Dirac equation, then the charge conjugate particle will also solve the transformed Dirac equation and C does that job. So it's defined by requiring certain job to be done. But that job is defined only once we know what are the gamma matrices. So in general, C will depend on my choice of gamma matrices. Okay. However, there is a choice, the Majorana choice, in which C is 1. In that choice, C is just 1, so that's the end of it. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's the end. I of thought it. the condition was that uh, real, uh, let's say if the real psi exists, then it will remain real in the Lorentz transformation. I thought that was the condition. Yeah, so uh, the point is that if this is true in general representation, yes. then this same relation will hold after Lorentz transformation. Okay, but it doesn't say that psi is exactly, doesn't say that every component of psi is real. Yes. For example, C might just mix up the components 
here so that first and second one get mixed so then first will be complex conjugate of second and second will be complex yes. conjugate of first the amount of information is the same yes. hmm? this is a restriction linear restriction between psi and psi star so in any basis but that restriction is simplest in the Majorana basis where it says literally every component is real in some other basis the components could be complex but they would be swapped under this by this so effectively it behaves as if it's real yes. but whatever is the Majorana condition in any basis it will be preserved by change by a Lorentz transformation and that's why we can't just put it by hand we need to find out what it is in order to carry out charge conjugation so this thing on the right hand side goes by the name of psi c psi charge conjugate okay so Majorana condition is the statement that psi is equal to its charge conjugate not its complex conjugate but if we can make C equals 1, then charge conjugate and complex conjugate become the same thing. Now, notice that any antiparticle, if, if a particle has electric charge, then its antiparticle has the opposite electric charge. So, if we have a Majorana particle, what must its electric charge be? Zero. So, the only particle in nature which is a fermion and known and which has electric charge zero are the neutrinos. And it's still an open question whether one or more of the neutrinos is a Majorana particle. That's not clear. There are experimental implications if it is. So it's very important to know the existence of this because it could be, neutrino could be a Majorana particle. We just don't know for sure. The others, electron and so on, cannot be. Good. Okay. Now we come to a very fundamental property of fermions, which we have ignored up to now. And I'll try to show you uh, why it has to be so, but uh, you should remember there are many reasons. So uh, fermion fields classically are anti-commuting numbers. Let's try to understand this. So supposing I have a Dirac spinner, just for now I won't complicate by putting any conditions. Dirac spinner is the general four component spinner with four complex components. Okay. So then psi with a given alpha and psi with some other, with some beta, which could be the same as alpha or different. These two fields, if I multiply them, satisfy the property. <coughs> that if I exchange their order when I write it, then it's minus, it changes so they anti-commute. Okay. Now it's puzzling because fields are supposed to be a number at each point of space and time. This is a component of a field, so it should be a number. It just doesn't happen to be a real or complex number. It's a new kind of number called a Grassmann number. Now you cannot derive this you can justify it by saying, well, when we decide what a field is supposed to be, we have to decide what are its properties and normally we take that fields just commute with each other unless we quantize them. Then you know that there are canonical commutation relations. So that's another story. Till we quantize them, there are no such relations. They are not operators. They are classical fields. That's why I'm doing classical physics in the first part of this course. So we would naively say that they just commute like any numbers. Mm, and then we'll worry about quantizing them later. But if we take them to commute like any numbers, we get a bunch of confusing results. And the moment we take them to anti-commute, everything settles down and all the confusion goes away. So let me show you some of these, some of these confusing results. Uh, so the first justification will come from Majorana spinners. By the way, we are not saying that Majorana spinners only are anti-commuting. We are saying all spinners are anti-commuting. But let's show that if Majorana spinners were not anti-commuting, we would have a lot of trouble. So let me work in the Majorana basis. So that psi alpha is psi alpha star. And now let me show you what the confusion is. Let's look at the Lagrangian. It would have a term I psi dagger psi dot. Right? You agree with that? Now, uh, 
we, this is true for the Dirac spinner, so it's true for any spinner. Hmm? Why are you looking so puzzled? Huh? Plus other term. It will have a term this. Okay. What is this? Both these indices are alpha and they are summed over four values. But it's Majorana, so dagger, which normally means star and transpose, the star is trivial, it's just transpose. Okay. So it's actually just I psi alpha psi alpha dot summed over alpha for a Majorana spin. So far, so good. Well, now let's assume these two things are commuting, psi and psi, not psi and, well, let's assume psi and psi commute with each other. Then this would normally be I by 2 D by DT of psi squared, right? Normal manipulation among functions, if I have two functions of time, then F F dot is the same as half D by DT of F squared. Okay, I've just retained the alpha indices. You could just fix one of the indices, but all the four are here. Good. What have we proved? We have proved that the kinetic part of the Lagrangian is a total derivative. That is a time derivative. If it's a time derivative, it doesn't contribute to the equations of motion at all. It doesn't contribute to the equation of motion. That means that there's no time evolution in the Dirac equation. That's clearly nonsense. Okay. In fact, it doesn't contribute to anything except boundary terms at t equals plus and minus infinity. When I integrate to get the action, then the part which integrates over time will evaluate this at each end. That's kind of nonsensical. So, this is the problem. Okay. Let's see how it's solved by requiring them to be anti-commuting. If they are anti-commuting, then I by 2 D by DT, the right side of that, is equal to, sorry, of this, is equal to I by 2 psi alpha dot psi alpha, I differentiated the first one, plus i by 2 psi alpha psi alpha dot. Now I differentiated the second one. But these two are not equal because in one of them psi alpha dot is on the left, in the other it's on the right. But if I want to compare them, I have to take psi alpha dot to the other side and I get a minus sign. So this is actually equal to minus i by 2 psi alpha psi alpha dot plus i by 2 psi alpha psi alpha dot which is 0. And then we realize we have been stupid all along because if they are anti-commuting then psi alpha psi alpha itself is 0. If I square anything which is anti-commuting I get 0. Psi alpha any component squared is just 0. Okay. So the right side of this equation, this equation in the box this one is 0, but this one is non-zero. It is not equal to the other side. There is no way to prove that I psi alpha psi alpha dot is equal to that. We guessed it was equal to that because we took the derivative on this and that and then we assumed that both of them can be commuted to be the same thing and we got this. But actually taking this is 0, its derivative is 0, nothing, but this is non-zero. This is not a total derivative at all. You can't write it as a total derivative. And if you don't agree with me, try writing it as a total derivative and you'll fail. So much better. Okay? Of course, you may say, well, maybe we were just too hopeful that Majorana fermions should exist. Maybe they don't exist. Well, it's a sensible representation of the Lorentz group. And the only nonsensible thing is we couldn't find any Lagrangian for it, which made physical sense until we made this assumption. Okay. Now, there are many other justifications, but let me give you one more, which I haven't put in the notes. I suppose in QFT1, you must have done an equal time commutation relation, which says that psi dagger 
x and t psi alpha beta of x prime and t and t commutator is equal to delta alpha beta delta i and delta 3 not i and delta 3 x minus x prime i certainly hope you've seen this relation what yeah so i'm jumping to quantizing i've not quantized in this course but i'm remind i'm i can use anything you have done in qft1 so after quantizing Okay, good. So, but this is an anti-commutator, not a commutator. You were told that this is this times this plus that times that, not minus. You accepted it? See how naive you all are. You just bought it. Somebody told you and it was okay. Okay, now we'll understand the deep reason. In field theory, we always set h, set h bar and c equals 1. But supposing we want to put back h bar, where shall I put h bar in this equation? It's always on the right side here just like p with x in quantum mechanics h bar is always there now what is the classical limit h bar goes to zero that's classical what does this say the anti commute so the classical limit of the anti-commutation relation is that they classically anti-commute. Now you may say, okay, but only because only working at fixed time and all. So every example that I give you is should is some more evidence. But the simplest thing to do, which makes perfect sense, is that just they always anti-commute classically. Nothing more to be said. Every single component anti-commutes with every other. Even if they are different fermions, like one is the field of an electron and the other is the field of a muon, they also anti-commute with each other. It's very puzzling from a conceptual point of view because you would say, look, I have a non-interacting muon and an electron. How on earth do they even know about each other to anti-commute with each other? Because commuting is a natural thing, comes naturally. Huh? But anti-commuting means that you have to know about the presence of the other guy. Because if I, what happens is that if I go around the other one, I come back with a minus sign. Okay, or if I go halfway around the other one, I come back with a minus sign. It's disturbing and people have been disturbed about it for years. The funny thing though is that until path integrals really became very, very essential in QFT, which I think happened really in the 70s, maybe 60s and 70s, Till that time, for about four, four decades of QFT, nobody sort of admitted this fact that they classically anti-commute. As far as I can recall, the textbook I learned from, which was Field Theory by Bjorkin and Drell, no mention of that. It just gives you the quantum anti-commutator, but never says that, well, notice that if you take h bar to zero, it means even classically they anti-commute. Hmm? But it's very crucial. And now, uh, okay, anyway, I think that's uh, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, is this really the first time all of you have heard this fact or you already knew it, anybody? Just curious. If you hadn't heard it before, it's fine, huh? I've heard because I've taken QFT2 before. QFT2 before, oh, okay. Okay, good. Very good. So, yeah, um, yeah, good. Now, the last uh, little comment to make here is that, well, we cheerfully defined the Hamiltonian by doing pi psi dot minus L. Remember, we said pi psi is del L by del psi dot. Huh. But L, the term that we differentiated was psi dagger psi dot with an I here. Now, this is the operator del by del psi dot which is going to hit this but suddenly we are in a bit of puzzle is it hitting from the left or is it hitting from the right when we do differentiation we never care whether we are acting d by dx that way or d by dx that way it's all the same thing now it will matter up to a sign because d by d psi dot must anti-commute with psi you can easily get a contradiction if it doesn't okay so actually, from this definition, it looks like pi should be minus i psi dot because this 
starts from here, goes through one psi dagger, changes its sign, and then removes psi dot. And so I get minus i sort psi dot. So we suddenly discover ambiguities. But luckily, there's one which saves us. We also wrote that h is equal to pi psi dot minus l, where we put the psi dot on the left. Oh, sorry, on the right. OK. So the best way to say it is that um, pi remains that, but the Hamiltonian is psi dot pi minus l. And this is psi dot del l by del psi dot minus l. So I hit with the differential operator from the left, and then I put back the psi dot also from the same side. Now I won't go wrong. There is a minus sign when this goes through psi dagger, but there's another one when this goes through psi dagger. So we are good. You can also define it to be del l del by del psi dot this way on L and then put the psi dot here. This time there's no minus sign and this also has no minus sign, so you again get plus. So you get these little tricky things to do with, with the Aswan numbers, but it all, you can trust me, it all settles down and you'll be doing some of these things later in the course when we do path integrals. Yes, please. So this, uh Ambiguity can be resolved when you are uh, putting, like when you are finding this Hamiltonian density, because uh, this minus sign is being counteracted by another Lagrangian term, which is inside, like another psi dagger, psi dot term, which is inside the Lagrangian. See, I first decide what's inside the Lagrangian, up to me. I can put inside the Lagrangian, I can say I have psi, so I can say that the Dirac Lagrangian is psi bar gamma mu del mu psi. Or I could say that it is I psi del mu like that gamma mu psi bar transpose, everything transpose. It will all work. It will be the same. Except that in this one, there is a net minus sign because psi bar has come to this side of psi. Okay. So I fix once and for all my Lagrangian. Now the rule for Hamiltonian is something like PQ dot minus L. The only important thing to realize is wherever, whichever side I differentiate from, I must put the Q dot from that side. Yes. You said that uh, the Hamiltonian is equal to del L by del pi dot. Uh, when it passes through pi dagger, it gives a minus yeah. sign. Anything passing through anything gives a minus sign. Uh, okay. If it's an operator, it might give something worse than a minus sign. It may also give me a anti-commutator term, which is the right-hand side of that. But here, there's nothing can happen like that. So anything which is a fermion passes through another. Also note that if something passes through two fermions, it doesn't pick up a sign because it passes twice. So for example, psi, uh, psi times psi, uh, let's say, psi times psi tilde <coughs> psi hat is equal. These are all three different fermions is the same as psi tilde psi hot at psi with no minus sign because to get from here to there psi has to hop once and it has to hop again. So there yes. exists a commutator or anti-commutator for an anti-commutator relation involving pi and psi hmm. where the RHS again has an h cross which yes, goes to zero. Exactly. Exactly. In fact this comes from that. So where did this come from? I don't know what your QFT one told you, but it's nothing but pi psi. The only new thing is that uh, it's an anti-commutator, but you have to put pi and psi. That's why there's an i, the same i which is there in x comma p. This is like, uh, or p comma x rather, or x comma p, I'm never sure. I think it's actually x comma p which has the plus i. So, it's here. So, psi comma pi has an i, right? It's an anti-commutator, so it does not uh, it does not, mm, no, it, it does, uh, yeah, actually that is true that it, well, yeah, that's also true that it doesn't matter. You're quite right, actually it just doesn't matter. So I could do either one. I think somebody's banging at the door, so I better stop. But anyway, I think I reached some logical conclusion. So see you next Monday. Uh, I think Monday, I'll let you know.